All right, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us here at Cross Point. Thanks for tuning in to be a part of our worship service here and to join us for this message that we have here today. My name is Micah Shannon. I'm not the pastor or anything like that, but it is always an honor and a privilege to be blessed with this platform to give the greatest message of all, the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Uh, let's just go to the Lord in a quick uh, prayer, if you would. Bow your heads with me. Uh, Father God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for all that you do. I come to you humbly as an imperfect man with the intent to bring glory to you, a perfect God, and hopefully lead people to your glory. And Lord, as I uh, reveal some of the, the lies that this world tells us and bring to light some of your truths, I pray that your presence be so ever present in our homes and most importantly in our hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Y'all, look, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to have to be honest before I even get into this message today. I, uh, I, I've had some struggles with, with doing this sermon. There's been points that I've almost wanted to throw in the towel a little bit because it's just been different. The uh, social media ministry, per se, the Facebook Live, the YouTube deals, it, it, it's kind of been a, a little different. It's been hard for me, a, a guy that's been uh, brought up in this town, in this area, that, uh, that people know my, my past, they know my flaws, and, and, you know, it's not the same as coming to the church and, and, and giving this platform and being able to preach the gospel to the people that's, that's watched me grow uh, as a man, that's watched me grow in my faith, that's watched me grow in, in my walk with Jesus Christ. Now there's this opportunity for, for people outside with just one click of the button, those people that are, that are, that are going to be critics, those people that are going to be judgmental, those people that are just going to look for something negative to say, well, tune in just so they can do it. And I was like, man, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I want to sign myself up for that because it's not the same as being with my church family. I, I don't know if I want to deal with that, that persecution or those attacks or those cynical people. So I had to spend some time really in prayer focusing on this and thinking about this. And, and God revealed some things to me that, you know, as I look at the life of Jesus, he too constantly had those cynical people. He too had those critics. He too had that persecution that he had to carry. There were there were people that were the Pharisees and the and and the and the, and the uh, non-religious that that also attacked him. But he uh, through his journey, he called regular dudes. He called regular people. He called people with prodigal pasts, with struggles, with with issues. And as I looked at that, I thought, you know what, I'm not alone. I'm not by myself. That, that maybe he chose me and maybe he's called me to be in this position and in this platform because there's other people just like me that have been brought out of the darkness and into the light through their relationship with Jesus that have this fear of sharing what he did in their life. Why? Because of what people might say. Because people might bring to the light their past and start talking about them if they do share it. That, that they'll discredit anything that they've ever done because... They know who they used to be. They remember them by, by what they did, not who they are now. And, and I felt like God nudged me and said, you know what? This is exactly why I need you and I need them to be the poster boys and the poster girls of what my love, my mercy, and my grace looks like. So now I can stand up here boldly, unapologetically, and unashamed to proclaim the gospel message of Jesus Christ with each and every one of you right here on this platform. So with that being said, I'm going to dive right into the Word today. I'm going to dig right into the Word in, in John chapter 1, verses 10 through 13. If you want to take a moment in your home to stand as a sign of reverence or respect for the mighty Word of God, I encourage you to do that. If you're in a your vehicle, please don't do that. But I'm going to go ahead and read the Word of God today. And like I said, John chapter 1, verses 10 through 13, and it reads that he, as in Jesus, was in the world. And the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and he did not receive them. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believed his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of the man, but of God. And I could just stay right there, but I want to read one more scripture, and it's Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, that reads, God decided in advance 
to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. Now, I want to dive back into, into John there in chapter 1, where it reads, For those that believed and received him have the right to become children of God. And, and, and I want to put emphasis on not only believe, but also receive, because sometimes people get confused and they think they believe that the, the devil himself believes that Jesus is a person. But have you received him into your heart? Have you received him as your Lord and Savior? That's the question. And like I said, I want to put emphasis on that, not just believe, but receive. To understand that, yes, we have been adopted into his family as children of God because of the relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. And as I, as I read these scriptures and, and as I really dig into this word, I can't help but to wonder, do we really believe that? Do we really believe that we are children of God? Do we really know who we are in Christ? Do we know whose we are? Because everywhere I look, I see people struggling with their identity. I know I personally have struggled with my own identity for many years trying to seek validation to be officially accepted by people for all the wrong reasons. And you know, the last time I dropped my kids off at school, before all this happened, they were still going to school. You know, we're in a sermon series entitled, In My Feelings. And this was right before a lot of this happened. My son was about to get his driver's license, and this was the last time I was going to be able to drop him off at school. They go to Kilgore High School, so I was kind of in my feelings a little bit. I wanted to soak it up and just kind of take it in for what it was and really appreciate the moment. So maybe I was in my fields as I left there, so I pulled out of where I dropped him off and come around where the student parking lot is. If you've ever been in front of Kilgore High School, the way I was leaving, the student parking lot is on the left, and then the high school is across the street on the right. So as I'm sitting there, I, I was kind of at this stage in my life where I'd really been praying to God, man, please change my perspectives. I don't just want to be one of those Christian people that just have a sour outlook on life and, and a negative look on things. So please change my perspectives. Break my heart for the things that break your heart. Allow me to look at life through the lens and what you look at life through. So as I'm sitting there, and like I said, I'm a little bit in my feelings, I'm I'm watching these kids cross, cross the crosswalk there, and it, it must have been last minute, get to school and, and rush in, rush hour for these kids going into the schoolhouse. So I'm sitting there, and, and, and as they come up, I see this first group of young men. They're the, uh, they're the athletic-looking young men in their letterman jackets, and they're walking, pushing, shoving, laughing, just being boys, you know, the, the, the guys that think they got life all figured out. They, they got everything down, you know. But maybe it's just kind of what I was praying about and where I, where I was at and, and my walk with God at the time. And I, I kind of saw something different in that moment. I, I saw the, uh, the fear that they possessed that maybe their identity has been found on their performance. Their identity might have been found and their, their value might have been found on their performance since the time they were little boys playing ball on a field or on a court. And, and and they have this this fear that that what if I don't have a next good game a good next game what if I lose my spot I might lose value in the eyes of my peers even worse I might lose value in the eyes of my own family and that's sad to me man because when them days of them kids being the best athlete and 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 you know being who people looked up to they, they might struggle with their identity. They might struggle and, and, and feel like they've lost value when the, when the days of good game, bud, good run, good pass. Boy, you was getting buckets last night. Hey, man, come here. Let me introduce you to so-and-so. He's a beast. He's a dog. And when those days are over, they might tend to struggle a little bit with thinking they've lost value in the eyes of the community and their peers and even their family. And that was kind of breaking my heart. And I don't want to take anything for any of them boys that's worked hard to get what they've worked hard for, the success that they've had for working hard for. I'm not taking that. But then behind them, I see this other young lady. She's coming up. She's walking across the street, and she's, she's got her head down. She's scared to death to face the day because, you see, this girl, she, she feels ina inadequate. She's not built like them other girls. She don't have that style, that swag. She might not be the prettiest. 
So she's walking into a world, world where boys hide behind their own insecurities, ranking her every day on her best physical features. And she feels of less value because she gets picked on, because she doesn't have that body, because she doesn't have that style, because she doesn't have that look, because she ain't quite flossing like the other girls. So now she struggles loving herself because she doesn't seem to have what seems to be valuable in the world that she lives in. And that's sad to me because she might carry that on into her, her adult years. It's hard for her now. But then coming behind her, I see that group of other girls, those girls that have those physical features, those pretty girls, the girls that have the style, the girls that get all the attention from the boys. And that was sad to me because I, I could see that they were kind of getting, finding their identity in these things that get them attention. The things that, that, that they, they feel like they have to flaunt and show off now to, to have value. And although that might seem great to some of these other girls and to the, some of these other people, like they have everything figured out, I can see behind that. I can see that the pressure of trying to be pretty and perfect all the time is a little overwhelming to them. That they too struggle, they too hurt, they too have issues, but this has to become a mask that they hide behind, act like everything's okay because they are it. That breaks my heart, man. And then you can see this other kid. Like I said, it was rush hour. There's kids crossing across the street left and right, and I'm just sitting there. This other kid, he's coming, and, and, and this young man, he's a loner. He's, he's just kind of straggling on in there, definitely a loner. But you know he's an intelligent kid. You can tell by looking at him, but he struggles socially. He's constantly messed with and picked on. By, by guys that, that do so to cover up their own insecurities. The only way he tends to find value is in some type of social cyber world or where he's the best gamer or where he can be the smartest kid helping the other people out so he can dummy them back down. He has to constantly be the smartest kid in the room. And so many times in his life he acts out because that negative attention is better than no attention at all. And that breaks my heart because he'll carry that with him for years to come. And then there's the, uh, the last young man I see coming along before I'm able to pass. He's the one I can really relate to. He's the young man I see walking through with his earphones in. He's jamming out. He's got it turned up, bobbing his head so he can tune out the reality of what his life really looks like. What he saw last night, what he saw this morning, what he's dealing with deep down inside. He just wants to turn it up so he can tune it out. Because the reality is hard and he don't want to face it. But the sad truth is, now he does nothing but hear the words and is being fed the culture of his favorite ungodly musician or his favorite rapper. And it's there that he is learning the narrative of what a man looks like. The hype of sex, money, and drugs are what he, what's glamorized in his ears all day long. So that's what he's fixated on becoming. I get it. I understand. I've earned a t-shirt. I thought I was Slim Shady at one time. Zero the most city done. Just like these young cats now think they're some type of young thug or whatever dude out there with the next face tattoos on. Trying to live up to the hype. Trying to be the dude and play the part that they've been acting like because that's what they've been fixated on. And it's a long road of struggles that will follow that lifestyle. And it bothered me. It scared me for them. I'm not judging them. I understand it. And I know a lot of you might be thinking, man, Micah, this kind of sounds like a, like a youth message. Maybe it is. Maybe the, the youth should be our intended audience at times, so we're not so focused on having to fix and work on the cleanup on aisle 20s and aisle 30s and aisle 40s and people into their 50s. Sometimes people never get over the hurt and the issues and the struggles from their teenage years. So maybe it is, but the reality of it is, is I see it trickle on down into the culture that we live in of people struggling with their identity through worldly values and things that they see every day. You see, I'm a barber. I got, I got guys come in, and I'm not judging anyone because, like I said, I understand it. But there's still grown men trying to impress people with how many girls they can hook up with, who they beat up at the bar last night, how much money they got, what they drive, where they live, how many friends they got. Just a bunch of grown folks basing their identity on social identity. You see, we, we got a lot of people struggling with their identity because it's so based off of a 
social identity, a social identity based off of worldly values. And then you, and then you, you got these grown women still walking around, still flaunting their best physical features in public and on social media because that's where they find attention. That's where their value, they feel like, is always laid. And they, too, are trying to find their identity based on social identity, relationship statuses, where they live, who they hang out with, their finances, having the cool kids. And unfortunately, man, the reality of it is, is trying to measure up to this world's expectations is a very slippery slope. And that slippery slope, you might be on top of it for a little while, but you, when, you, when you start sliding, you're going to end up on the bottom. And, and that's why I love what the Word of God says, the NLT version of Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. It reads, do not impress others, but be humble. Just simply, do not impress others, but be humble. And that really puts emphasis on it's a slippery slope. If you spend all this time trying to impress others, you're going to end up sliding. If you're focused on impressing man and not God, then, then you're going to have struggles. And if you can't remain humble, you will be humbled. And most of that comes the hard way. But the good news is, is all that's going to change at salvation, right? It's all going to change at salvation or what people believe is salvation. Like I came to church and I believe in Jesus now. And I, I think I prayed the prayer that, that the pastor prayed. So I'm good. So all that's going to change, right? I'm no longer going to worry about these things. And, and, and that's why I have to ask, have you truly believed? Have you truly received? Do, do we really believe that we are children of God? Do we really know who we belong to? I mean, do you really think God cares if you're rich or if you're poor? He won't care or think less of you if you're broke. And if you have been blessed with financial success, that's great. But God would love to see you use that to make a difference, not to make you different. You think he cares or is impressed with your physical features? What you drive, who you hang out with, how tough you are, who you're hanging out with, all your worldly accomplishments? Do you understand who you are? Do you know who you belong to? If you're living for him... Do you think he's impressed? He's not. And I'm not trying to take away from anybody's worldly accomplishment that they've worked hard for to get success. I'm not. But sometimes we, we got to make sure we're not fixated on allowing that to become our identity and thinking that's who we are, is our accomplishments and what success we have and what things we got. And I know there's some people out there going, Micah, man, what are you talking about this world? You keep talking about this world. I don't know what world you live in. But this is the real world. This is reality. Maybe you've lost all grasp of it, but this is the real world. And it took me a little time to realize, and I still struggle with this from time to time, that there's a big difference in being in this world and being of this world. There's a big difference in being in this world and being of this world. And because of that, we as people, you know, sometimes we struggle with who we are because of the labels that's now been put on us by this world. That's not who you are in the eyes of your heavenly Father. That's not who you are in the eyes of God. It's not. These are a bunch of worldly labels that are irrelevant. Irrelevant labels. You're rich. You're poor. You're a nerd. You're white trash. You're an addict. You're a drunk. You're promiscuous. You're, a, you're okay. You're stupid. You suck. You're a loser. You're just like your daddy. A bunch of worldly labels. And it's because of these worldly labels that so many struggle to really get their God-given identity, their God-given identity. And, and, and it reminds me of a word in the Bible. I love the Bible. I love the Word of God. And, and, and when I read this, it opened my eyes to some things. It's in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. It reads, we know that we are of God. Praise God. We know we are of God and that the whole world lays under the sway of the wicked one. The whole world lays under the sway of the wicked one. This world that we live in that has labeled us, that has us struggling with our identity, the lies, they, they lie under the sway of the wicked one. You see, Satan knows that if we don't know who we really are, then we can never defeat him in Christ Jesus' name. As a believer, it's very important to understand who you are in Jesus. You have identity in him. 
You are a child of God. You matter. You have a plan, a purpose. You have value. He loves you. You are his. The only way you will ever understand this truly is by a real-life, tangible relationship with Jesus. It's in that relationship that you will find relevance. Like I said, these worldly labels, they're all irrelevant. You want to find true relevance, you'll find it in Jesus. You'll start to understand who you are. You'll find deliverance from who you used to be and what you used to do and the struggles that you had and the labels that people will put on you. You find hope in Jesus. Not to say that there won't be struggles and hard times. There's going to be struggles. There's going to be hard times. Jesus wept himself. But there is hope in tomorrow. And we see through the life of Jesus and what a life with being with him is like, there's always hope tomorrow. This is always a season. It's always temporary because joy will come in the morning. Joy comes with a life with Jesus. And peace comes with him understanding that. You see, God put in a redemptive plan through Christ Jesus to save us, to save our souls, to be rooted in him and to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. Not in the ways of this world. Trying to find validation in this world is a dead-end road. Let me say that again. Trying to find validation in this world is a dead-end road. But when you find validation in Jesus, things change. Your perspectives change. The lens in which you look at life through changes. Then you can find your validation in Jesus. You ever had a credit card or like a, uh, like a gift card, and the only way you can grant access to that card is through that validation number? That's what Jesus is to us. He is, he is that validation code. He is what grants us access to the Father. He is what allows us to have a life, a better life, and a future life in heaven, free from all these burdens and these struggles with who we really are. We got to believe it. We got to receive it. You see, I, I'm also reminded of a scripture when I think about these things and, and struggling with these labels and, and worldly value and who we are in Christ Jesus. It's in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. It reads that no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. No one serving as a soldier as a, of the kingdom, no one serving as a child of God, no one that understands who they are, that they are a child of God, that understands who they are in Christ Jesus, no longer has to get entangled with these civilian affairs because now you know whose you are, you know who you live for, you know who you're with, and you will begin to live a life that is pleasing to your commanding officer, God, the Alpha, the Omega, the first, the last, the great I am, God, our Father in heaven. You see, we've been set apart. Through Christ Jesus, we've been set apart, and no one or nothing can take away your God-given identity. But it's up to you, and it's up to me whether you want to accept it or whether you want to reject it. we got to start to just lean into God's truths instead of this world's lies, because it's his truth that reminds us that we are enough. It's his truth that might remind you that just because that person cheated on you, broke you down, and made you feel like you were nothing, that you still matter. That your value doesn't lie in that person and in that relationship, but God's got you. That your value and, and, and who you are lies in him, not them. It's his truth that reminds you that even though you just lost your job, that he still has a plan for your life and he will see you through this. I understand there's a lot of people scared right now. There's a lot of people losing jobs right now. There's a lot of people worried about how they're going to put food on the table. What am I going to do about this situation? The fear of poverty and economic crisis is starting to outweigh the fear of this virus. And people are scared. But the reality of it is that the truth is that God's got you. He's been seeing his people through since the beginning and he's going to see us through this as well. But we got to wake up and lean on him. You're going to be all right. It's his truth that reminds you that even though you've been abandoned by some friends and some family, that I'm telling you, you're not alone. He is always with you. You are not alone. And it's his truth that reminds you that your life is way, worth way more. Your life is worth way more than what someone thinks about you. That's his truth. You see, it's his truth that reminds us that we're chosen 
for something greater than, than, than things of this world. It's truth that reminds us that you're a royal priesthood. It's truth that reminds you that you're a special possession. His special possession. I didn't make that up. That's 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. And that might be verbiage with his cho chosen people and his royal priesthood for that of Israel, but it is also for us because we are, we are now found in Jesus Christ. We are no longer black, white, Latino. We are one race, and that is a spiritual race, and that is the people that are children of God. We are a chosen people, a royal priesthood for all those who believe and receive. But do you believe it? Are you willing to receive it? You see, we, we got we to gotta just start running from these lies, push them to the side, tell them to miss me with that, and start living for God's truth. Because they might label you, and, and going back to the beginning with some of my struggles with who he called and who he used, he used regular people, regular disciples, a regular fisherman, a girl that had to have demons cast out of her, regular people that were labeled by that, but after they came and they followed Jesus and they followed his example and they were led by him, now their new label is disciple of Jesus. So do you want to accept the true label and your true identity, identity by walking with being a child of God and being a disciple of Jesus Christ? Because when you do that, like I said, everything changes. Your perspective changes. The hard times ain't what they used to be because you know whose you are. You know who you are with. And I would, man, I just want to take this time to extend an invitation to you if you've never accepted that, that if, if you've never accepted that truth, that if you've never allowed Christ to come into your heart to lead God and direct you to be a part of this family, to be a part of this royal priesthood chosen by God as his people, to just accept it. I just want to extend that invitation to you. To come alongside and follow Jesus. To find your new identity as a disciple of Christ and not a label of this world. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for all that you've done. And I thank you for giving us Christ Jesus to grant us access to you to be children of God. And I pray that if no one has, if there's anyone out there that hasn't accepted that, that they do so today, and they do so today with this prayer, and they mean it by the, from the bottom of their heart, that Jesus, you are my Lord. You are the Lord of my life. I believe that you came and you lived a perfect life, and you died a prisoner's death, a, a terrible death, but you defeated sin and death, and you rose and defeated it, and that we are allowed to have new life through you. I pray that your Holy Spirit Enter me, lead God, and direct my life, life, and you forgive us where we've fallen short. We thank you. We love you. And in Jesus' name, amen.